Marco. Sean. Swoosh, swoosh. Or I mean, room, room. <laughs> room, room. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it's been a, a quite interesting uh, chats on the roads until this point. Until and this I one? feel like we're almost almost in Las Vegas, but we haven't left yet because we're, we're actually not there. driving this year. We are actually flying there. And uh, I, I believe this is our last pre-event episode. So This is the last scheduled one, yeah. There, there might be something that comes up, but I, all the ones that caught my attention, we've had the, we've had the uh, great pleasure of chatting with folks. And I'm really excited for this one with uh, Dr. Kathleen Fisher from DARPA. Kathleen, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. We left the best for last. There no offense go. to the other, but I, I was really, <laughs> really looking forward to this. Well, they were all they're all last until the next last one. So they're oh, yeah, all the best right. along so the way. I'm, I'm OK to yeah. say that all the time. All right. That's right. Cool. I, I prompted <laughs> chat GPT for that response uh, and uh, gave me it. No, so th this uh, this is really cool. So uh, as folks know, if they've been following the coverage or look, look at the uh, Black Hat schedule, there's an AI summit and uh, Dr. Fisher is the, the keynote there talking about enhanced national security of AI driven cybersecurity. And clearly this is something important, um, not, not just for the US, but for our, our allies and partners and for all the people that, that rely on technology for banking and power and, and, and water, clean water, everything, right? So let's, uh, let's start off maybe Doctor, if you can maybe share a few words about some of the things you've been involved with over the years and and maybe your view on the the importance of this topic now. I mean, we could, we could say yesterday it was important as well, but what, what's going on at the moment? Uh, yeah, so my background a little bit. Um, so I first came to DARPA in 2011 and started a program called Hackems, which was about could we build software for vehicles that would make it much harder to hack into those vehicles using an approach called formal methods, which at the time everybody thought was really just for toy problems. But what we showed in Hackems was that, in fact, you could use formal methods to build software for, say, a helicopter that would make it so that a world-class red team couldn't break into the helicopter. So we started out in a quadcopter. And at the beginning of the program, the red team showed that they could hack into the quadcopter no problem and that they could hack into uh, Unmanned Little Bird, which was like a, a helicopter that was big enough to have two pilots but could also fly autonomously. No one was surprised that they could hack into the quadcopter. People were pretty surprised that they could hack into the unmanned little bird and take over remote control. And then 16 months later, after the formal methods researchers got done, the red team again tried to ha hack into the quadcopter and they couldn't do it, which was actually shocking to pretty much everybody except for the formal methods researchers who knew that their tools had advanced uh, far enough along to be useful for things besides toy problems. And then um, the, re the researchers got to work on the unmanned little bird. And unlike the quadcopter, the unmanned little bird was ITAR restricted and proprietary. So the formal methods researchers couldn't directly work on it. They had to teach the aviation engineers how to use the formal methods tools on the code base of the unmanned little bird. Um, and at the end of another 16 months, the red team had to do it again. And the red team couldn't hack the unmanned little bird at that point. Um, at that point, the, the unmanned little bird was on the ground um, and they let the red team um, work on a partition on the unmanned little bird. So they no longer had to attack from off the unmanned little bird. They could attack from inside the partition, um, but they, they, they could crash their own partition, but they couldn't um, crash the rest of the helicopter. Um, at the end of the program, the red team got to do it again while the, quad while the helicopter was in flight with two test pilots on board. And thankfully, the, they couldn't crash the helicopter. <laughs> and the test pilots couldn't tell that they were flying a high assurance version of the helicopter instead of the, the regular version of the helicopter, really demonstrating that formal methods had come a really long way and were, in fact, ready to um, tackle real military relevant systems and that our kind of learned helplessness in software that we don't know how to build software that isn't very hard to hack into is is wrong that we do know how to build software to a much higher standard of, of correctness um, so that's some of my background is is isn't doing that um, and a lot of the same changes underlying changes in software and, and computers that underlay that success that softwares have uh, software has um, or computers have much more memory and are much more powerful 
underlaying that success in formal methods is what's underlying the success in machine learning, right? You couldn't have, like neural nets started out a long, long, long time ago and, and enjoyed in fact success in the 1980s, but we didn't have enough data, we didn't have enough compute, we didn't have enough memory that now, like we do in fact, and that's leading to the chat GPT algorithmic advances too, but a lot of the um, advances in hardware and software leading into the amazing changes that we saw um, in with the release of ChatGPT, making uh, bursting on the stage and making everybody aware of, oh my God, we have new technology that we need to figure out how to take advantage of the upsides and how to mitigate the threats on the on the downside. Oh, incredible. I'm actually reading uh, the, the Singularity is Nearer, the, the updated book from Ray Kurzweil. And uh, it, it focuses a lot on how it's speeding up the process because of the access to faster computers and, and computational power. So um, my, my brain was already exploding there, but I do know that DARPA has always been at the forefront for research and technology, you know, the, the internet itself, GPS and, and other innovations. So I'm not surprised, obviously, that you guys are looking at AI and, and all it can do. So in a... In a nutshell, we're here to tease your uh, your keynotes at uh, at Block Hat. What what are you focusing on on that presentation? Yeah. So one of the key things is the AICC uh, program competition, which will be highlighted at at DEF CON. So AICC is a is a challenge program, which is looking at again this combination of AI and cyber reasoning systems. With can we use that combination of the the power of AI systems that we've seen recently with the ability of cyber reasoning systems, so program analysis tools that can look at code to find vulnerabilities. And the, the challenge is, can we automatically find and fix vulnerabilities in real open source software? So uh, a while ago, maybe 10 years ago, there was the Cyber Grand Challenge, which was, can we uh, find and fix, can we find vulnerabilities in synthetic software, software that was just made up for the purpose? But AICC is, can we find and fix vulnerabilities in real open source software? Um, and we're doing that in partnership with Google, AI, Anthropic, and Microsoft, so that the, the teams that are competing were given access to state-of-the-art models. And you know, as those models improved, they were able to access those, those state-of-the-art models. Um, they were five different um, challenge problem sets, so five different real open source software tools. And each one of those had a whole bunch of uh, problems within them, uh, instances of the problems where they needed to find vulnerabilities and the competitors um, got to submit their tools and, and uh, the organizers ran the cyber reasoning systems again or are running. It's, it's uh, uh, in the background right now and we will see the results in the, uh, over the course of the, the competition uh, at, at Black Hat, uh, at, sorry, at DEF CON uh, in Las Vegas. So we're, we're super excited about that. I think one of the really important things about the competition is it's not just to can you find the vulnerabilities, it's can you find and suggest patches. And that's you know taking the difficulty level up another notch, but if you're able to fix them, that's just a huge step forward in being useful. Um, part of the reason why this is really important is we have a vast amount of sort of technical debt in our, um, our infrastructure. Like we have many critical infrastructure um, sectors that are running software that has large amounts of, of vulnerabilities in them that are accessible to adversaries. We see lots of ransomware that's taking advantage of this. And the um, amount of, of resources that are necessary to go and, and fix those vulnerabilities is enormous. And um, if we can find and fix those vulnerabilities at speed and scale automatically, that would just be a huge, huge game changer. So this competition is kind of the first step of like, is the, is AI technology paired with um, program analysis kinds of technologies, more old school um, uh, program analysis kind of capabilities, is it ready for that kind of challenge of being able to find, not just point out the problems, like people don't really like it when you're like, you have a problem, you have a problem, you have a problem. Like that's like, yeah, like I didn't already know I had lots of problems. But <laughs> if it's like, you have a problem and I have a solution, like that's a lot, that's a lot more helpful. Even if somebody has to go and look and check, it's still very helpful. Yeah, for sure. And and then you mentioned the collaboration with companies that are commercial entities. So that there, there is that and, and I think for many years, many conferences we hear 
how important it is that the government and collaborate with the commercial. So we, we are there. I think we're happy to see that. And uh, can you highlight that in how it does accelerate the progress in, in what we're trying to do? 100%. Yes, it's one of DARPA's um, superpowers. So in fact, DARPA's founding charter, uh, like DARPA was founded after the Sputnik satellite launch uh, to have it so that the U.S. government was never again taken by surprise, right? We're supposed to be detecting and creating strategic surprise. The founding document of DARPA is actually like a page and a half. It's really, really short. It's like amazing that the government can actually do something in a page and a half, something as substantial as DARPA in a page and a half. And what that founding document actually, all it really does is give DARPA the ability to contract with organizations. And it gives us the ability to contract with national labs, with companies, big companies, with small companies, with universities. Basically, it gives us the ability to go and make deals with all sorts of different kinds of organizations in order to create new capabilities, new technology for strategic surprise. And so that's what DARPA does. We go and work with universities. We go with work, work with big companies. We work with small companies, with startups, uh, with national labs in order to create new technologies. And so that's an example of with, with what we're doing here with AICC. We're working with Google, Anthropic, OpenAI, and, and Microsoft. We're also working with the um, Open Source Software Foundation. They are helping the competitors make it so that when they find a patch, they have it in the right format so that um, that patch could easily fit into the pipeline of actually going and being applied to software to get it fixed since the Open Source Software Foundation manages the patch process for many, much of the open source that is run in the um, in the US and in fact, the in the world. Um, and then the, the competitors, the competitors themselves, there are teams that are formed from universities, there are teams that are formed from companies, big companies and small companies. Um, in order, um, there was a, another sub competition that was for small companies to be able to write papers about their solutions um, uh, to give to get a million dollars for the best. The seven teams got a million dollars of prizes um, for the best uh, prize, uh, the best con uh, concepts uh, towards the the competition as well. Um, so uh, the DARPA ecosystem is very broad in its different kinds of of um, participants because it is the you know the best we're basically we're always looking for the best ideas and the best people to be able to create the new technology for strategic surprise whether that best idea is coming from a big company a small company a startup an academic institution or a, you know national lab kind of organization yeah. so i'd love to hear that you're you're working with open ssf i had a, had a great chat with that team as well and uh they're doing amazing amazing work and then you talked about the breadth, and I want to ask you about kind of the depth, because there, there's well, firmware and maybe even chip level analysis up to, I'll, I'll say, the cloud, right, where stuff stuff runs across multiple systems that isn't on-premises necessarily. So can you speak to that? And then also the, um, yeah, how, because AI crosses all of that. Do you, do you have to look at things differently versus a, a a segment at a time, um, like maybe you yeah. had to in, in the past. For sure. So the, the AICC program is focused on the software piece, but DARPA has other efforts that are focused um, more broadly across the, the stack. So the Harden program, for example, is looking across the entire stack for looking for where abstraction boundaries um, uh, are, are um, not perfect and where an, uh, there's like a weird machine that is formed by violations in the abstraction boundary and that given an uh, attacker in a way to break in and, and make the machine do what the attacker wants as opposed to what the legitimate owner of a system wants by um, thinking across abstraction boundaries. Um, so, uh, so that program is ex exactly looking at exactly what the, is focused on exactly the problem that you are focused on. Um, I think one of the challenges in creating a DARPA program is, or one of the things that we think about when we create a DARPA program is what is the, the scope of the program? How do you chew off or bite off just the right level of thing to, to be ambitious enough, but not too ambitious, right? If you, like the Hackums program that I was describing earlier about hacking a helicopter, we assumed the hardware was correct, not because we thought the hardware was correct, obviously the hardware is not correct, but if you take up too much, then you don't solve any problem. But if you take up too small a thing, then it's not, it's not, you're not pervade, you're not making an, 
an advance that is useful to anybody. So um, with the example of AICC focusing on software, but Harden focusing across the stacks, we're, we're trying to make sure that we are making progress in all of the relevant uh, technical areas. Well, you know, I love that because I think in general, the, the, the larger society start listening and understanding, uh, understanding maybe a, too much, but you know, at least hearing about AI, I think when it started to get applied to the, the self-driving car and, and you know, the competition that were held in the desert with the universities. And there, as you said, it was like a very specific, go bring the car from point A to point Z, wherever it is, and, and let's see who can do it. And people really can, I love the idea of you need a box in order to think outside the box. So constraint yeah. can make you very, very creative in, in general. Indeed. I think having like a compelling narrative can be super, super powerful. Right. Like we've been trying, one of the things we've been trying to do is like the, the Hackums program that I told you that demonstrated that formal methods were ready for prime time. DARP has had maybe eight or nine more programs after that working on specific pieces. Um, and we've successfully transitioned parts of those technology to specific programs of record, specific systems in the military. But so far, we haven't seen widespread adoption, maybe other than Amazon Web Services, which are using formal methods like many, many places. So it sort of feels like Amazon Web Services got the full message, but kind of the rest of industry is still only like drinking little pieces of the Kool-Aid as opposed to like drinking the whole jug. And given the, the world that we're living in, it feels like we need much broader adoption um, because of things like Volt Typhoon. Um, and so how do we accelerate that, that broader adoption? And um, it could be that we, like, we need a, a more compelling demonstration. I think back to the work of Stefan Savage and Yoshi Kono, where they demonstrated kind of in a lab that you could remotely hack into a car. And they did it you know, in a lab and very safely, and they did responsible disclosure. Um, and then I think about the work that other people did hacking into a car on a highway with a reporter, and it was highlighted in Wired magazine, and there was a picture of a Jeep in a ditch. And that got cars recalled and got way, way more attention. Like it didn't scientifically show anything that Stefan Savage and Yoshi Kono's work didn't show. But in some sense, it had m more of an impact. And like there's tons of reports that show that um, like you can make an airplane fall out of the sky with a cyber attack, for example, but people don't believe that. So like maybe if we like did a demonstration that showed that you could take a mothballed airplane and you know, that maybe that would make people like more, more adopt cyber, like be, have it prioritize in a higher way, adopting techniques that would make it so that, um, in terms of like, we can't afford to adopt these techniques. No, you can't afford not to adopt these techniques. Um, and it's that narrative, it's that demonstration that is compelling. And it's it's figuring out what's the right size problem to adopt and what's the right demonstration and what's the right narrative to convince people. And and that's part of like AICC. We have the 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 cyber the the town, the city that we're building in the the convention center in Las Vegas. Part of the city is there to show the results of the teams that are competing, to show how they are doing and, and to give us a platform for demon for announcing who the, the winners are. But another, the reason it's a city is to show the infrastructure and to have people who are attending be able to see how cyber runs the city and to show the effects of cyber attacks on the city so that people have, who attend have a visceral understanding of, oh, cyber, it's not just about, like cyber attacks, it's not just about ransomware, it's not just about my data being stolen. It could shut down a hospital. It could shut down like the water systems. It could like we it's not just a nice to have. It's an essential thing. And so like the goal of the the city is twofold, right? It's it's about showing the how the competition is running, but it's also about creating this visceral understanding of how important cyber infrastructure is and how important having that cyber infrastructure be um to pay down the technical debt that is currently really, really high in our cyber infrastructure, which is a message we're hearing all the time from CISA, from the White House, et cetera. But by telling it in a, in a narrative, viscerally compelling way, hopefully driving that home in a way that is more impactful. 
Well, hopefully we wouldn't have to shut to put down an airplane to to prove that. But you know, at, <laughs> so at a certain shut point, down with, just, with people. <laughs> at a certain point, just trust us, right? <laughs> you know, we're, yeah, who's gonna you know what we're talking the about. <laughs> We were thinking about like, you know, those mothballed airplanes that are just sitting out in the desert. Perhaps they could, you know, do one last piece of service. Yes. That I drive by those event. quite often. And yeah, I, that would be a big I event. often wonder what, 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 will, what will become of them or what will come of them. Uh, now I know. <laughs> now I know. Well, just a thought uh, experiment, to be clear. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I, I want to kind of give folks a, a sense of what they might hear. So don't, I don't want to, I don't want to share anything that would uh, prevent somebody from coming to see you in person in Vegas for your keynote, but who, who are you speaking to during this keynote session? Is it business leaders? Is it are the, are the, the practitioners, policymakers, risk managers? Who, who is it you're speaking to? What can they expect to hear from you? Yeah, that, I mean, that combination of people, people who want to understand a little bit about how, how DARPA works and why DARPA is doing what it's doing in this area of uh, cyber and AI, why it's really important that DARPA, DARPA works in the combination of cyber and AI, contextualize a little bit to the state of the world um, and the state of technology right now, uh, hopefully accessible to an uh, audience that isn't super technical. Um, so... I won't be going into the weeds uh, very much, not any more than the weeds that I already have here. So if you've understood what I've said today, you should be able to understand what I'm saying uh, in the keynote. Um, That's great. And I know one of the one of the points is to reinforce and reinvigorate and and yeah, drive drive better outcomes through public private uh, collaboration. So will you be able to share how businesses can get involved and and how individuals can get involved and what they ex can expect from DARPA and what DARPA needs from them. Uh, in, in, indeed, that's not a secret. That's a message that I'm happy to, to say uh, whenever, right? Uh, I mean, the, the most involvement is DARPA is always hiring program managers. Um, we have about 23 or so in I2O and a quarter of DARPA. Everybody who has decision authority at DARPA uh, is a term empl uh, temporary employee. You serve about four years. So that means DARPA is kind of hiring a quarter of the program managers every year. So uh, it's an amazing job and the best job I've ever had, more or less. So uh, that there's that possibility. Of course, it's not very many people. Um, DARPA has... Um, all of the technical work is done by, we call them performers, people who respond to calls for participation in the program. So things like Harden and Hackums and AICC, well, AICC is a competition, so it's a little bit different, but Harden and Hackums, those two programs I talked about, those were um, uh, a call was put out a BAA and people responded by writing proposals and some of those were selected. So looking for calls and then responding is a is another good way to participate in, in a, uh, as a DARPA in DARPA's efforts. Um, and there's DARPA Connect, which is um, a way to find out more about DARPA and how to get involved. Those are resources that are online all the time. So uh, people who have questions and are curious about DARPA, I would encourage to go search online for DARPA Connect and go find those resources. There's things like the Heilmar Catechism, which is sort of the, uh, um, the way by which DARPA programs get started. So go find those questions and think about them. Well, I think DARPA is it's just cool. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of all the Apollo program and Mercury, all the, you know, the history of NASA. And, you know, the, the, you mentioned the Sputnik and DARPA start, you know, rolling the sleeves and, and getting on inventing stuff and researching back in, in those days. So always amazing. Uh, the talk uh, will be Tuesday, August 6, 11.40 a.m. to 12.05 exactly p.m. you cannot go longer than that <laughs> i guess and the south pacific f level zero and i encourage everybody to to go and and learn more about uh, what kathleen fisher uh, teased us here today and uh sean we will be there and i am very very excited for all that has to come at black hat i know i know great uh, a great summit uh, ahead for sure and i'm i'm excited to hear about future challenges and and hopefully some off options for uh, solutions as well <laughs> a, a lot a lot to uh, a lot to chew on when it comes to ai so uh, i'm i'm excited to hear what you have to say and uh, hopefully have a good good turnout and good engagement from folks 
and good results coming out of out of Black Hat and DEF CON, both the, uh, the the talk, the summit, and and the competitions as well. Definitely looking forward to seeing the results of the competition. We all are. And for everybody else, either you can make it to Las Vegas or not, we're going to try to bring uh, Black Cat to you as we've been trying to tease you about it. And definitely we'll report on what we see there and the other conversation that we're going to have. So Kathleen, thank you so much for your time and thank everybody for listening and watching us if uh, that's what uh, you like to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.